Hello and welcome. Helicopters are technically complex machines. There can be no doubt about their usefulness. That does demand piloting that is quite different to that of fixed wing aircraft. Recently, we lost two good friends in a Robinson R22 Beta crash. This helicopter was cruising at 1,700 feet AGL when it ascended 100 feet abruptly followed by a rapid descent of 100 feet per second. This indicates a negative G pushover, notorious for inducing a rotor bump. Jacob from Helicopter Lessons in 10 Minutes or Less explains that there are three types of rotor systems. For this video, I'll be covering three types of rotor systems. The first one being a rigid system. Next one being the semi-rigid system. And lastly, we'll cover the fully articulated rotor system. Now each one's slightly different, but more so just kind of building off of each other. Now, in the beginning of modern day helicopters, the first few designs had rigid rotor systems. These were simple in design and quite literally rigid when it came to the blades, the hub, and the mast. So let's see what that looked like. We have the mast attached to the hub. And quite simply, the blades just coming off of that. Like I said, very simple uh, system. The only motion was just the rotation of the blades and the feathering of the blades. Now, as we already know from uh, our uh, compensation of dissymmetry of lift, the blades must flap in addition to feathering to compensate for that dissymmetry of lift. If you have any questions of that, on that, I would recommend watching that video. I'll put the link in the description as well as should pop up in the video above. Um, but in this system, the stresses of aerodynamic forces were actually absorbed solely by the blades. The blades were flapping up and down. Um, and also during this time, airfoils were made of very lightweight metals like aluminum. So you can only imagine if uh, we have lightweight metals like aluminum flexing up and down, up and down, up and down, kind of like a tin can, it starts to weaken uh, the metal over time. So engineers needed to find something better, uh, something more survivable because these blades were just wearing out. But in summary, rigid rotor system, rigidly made, simple in design, and offered the ability for feathering of the blades. Now, it wasn't long until a solution was found for increasing this rotor survivability, and a semi-rigid rotor system was designed. Now, this system incorporated a, uh, a way for the system to pivot. So here we had the mast, and then the blades attaching to the hub as such. So now, um, this, is, this system, also known as a teetering or a seesaw system, incorporated a horizontal or a flapping hinge, and that was located right here. So the blades no longer absorbed the loads of flapping and therefore weren't as prone to failure. So this rotor system uh, could flap and feather for, or to compensate for dissymmetry of lift. So what did that look like? Let's say you wanted to put some kind of uh, cyclic input, the entire system would rock along that horizontal or that, that flapping hinge and allow the rotor system to absorb the stressors of flight instead of the blade bending up and down, putting the strain on the blade. So now the entire system could pivot along that horizontal joint. Um, however, this system is subject to mass bumping, which is where the mast and the rotor system um, can potentially make contact, usually during something like slope landings or low G flight, and uh, potentially could have rotor separation if this impact was enough to sever the mast, make the entire rotor system uh, fly off. So that is one limitation of a semi-rigid rotor system. But the rotor system's constantly evol evolving engineers eventually developed a fully articulated rotor system. Now this system allowed each blade to flap and feather independently instead of all together on a, uh, a pivot point and it was able to overcome mass bumping. It also introduced the ability for blade hunting, that is the ability of blades to lead and lag. So what does that look like? We have the mast, we have the hub, and each blade given the ability to flap and feather independently of each other, no longer a seesaw joint. So it's able to compensate for the flapping and the feathering. And now, kind of looking down from the top, we can see how it has the compensation um, for blade hunting and we'll get into a little bit more of that. Now blade hunting 
is the ability for blades to, to lead and lag. So why is that? Well, due to the law of conservation of angular momentum, also called Coriolis force, as the blades flap up and their compensation for dissymmetry of lift, the mass of the blade tends to shift inward. So as the advancing blade flaps up, the mass shifts inward, the blade wants to accelerate. Well, this is putting stress on the blade if the blade is having to absorb it. So a fully articulated system gives that ability to have one more set of pivot points for the blades so that they can lead and lag and have some flexibility so the blades are no longer absorbing that stress of the Coriolis uh, force. So uh, kind of an example of that Coriolis force is imagine a spinning figure skater who brings her arms inwards, tends to speed up, and then bring her, brings her arms outward, tends to slow down. This is because of the mass is getting closer to the, the point of rotation and causes that speeding up and slowing down. So with a fully articulated system, we have this vertical hinge or the lead lag hinge, which allows these blades to kind of flex so that they're, uh, the blade itself isn't absorbing the stress of the Coriolis force. Now the rotor system is absorbing it usually with a series of dampeners along that lead lag link. All right, so uh, this system uh, increased the reliability of the blades, increased the blade life, and allowed, once again, the ability for feathering plus flapping plus hunting. And I should have covered it earlier, but the semi-rigid allows for feathering plus flapping. So as you can see, each system adding a little bit more and more. Now there have been upgrades in all systems and all three systems are still seen today. Now the rigid system, uh, commonly used by the Red Bull BO105, which uses fiberglass uh, composite blades to kind of counter the, uh, uh, what we talked about, the tin can example. They're able to absorb a lot more stresses on the blades. Um, but this system itself is probably one of the most responsive and agile systems in the world. It just has the limitation of putting a lot of strain on the blades. but uh, the BO-105, the Red Bull helicopter can do it uh, and, you know, perform some of the most impressive helicopter stunts in the world with this rotor system. Uh, the semi-rigid design, probably the most prevalent system uh, by today's standards, can be seen, you know, in the earliest UH-1 Huey all the way up to the modern-day Robinson R-22. And then your fully articulated system, usually seen on modern-day military aircraft, uh, law enforcement aircraft, you know, things like the Apache, the Black Hawk, the Little Bird, uh, stuff like that. He then goes on to explain what induces a rotor bump. Now mass bumping can be a sensitive subject for some because it usually deals with expensive repairs of rotor components and in some cases catastrophic component damage resulting in death. That said, it's a subject that requires understanding if it uh, affects your helicopter. I say if only because it only applies to a semi-rigid or a teetering rotor system. Now if you're not familiar with what exactly a semi-rigid rotor system is, I'd recommend watching my types of rotor systems video. I'll put the links in the comment uh, as well as it should pop up in the video um, in the top corner of your screen right now. But mass bumping, just like the name implies, is when the main rotor hub contacts or bumps the, uh, the rotor mass. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So just like from the types of rotor systems video, uh, where I drew the difference in between uh, the systems, the semi-rigid system with the mast attached to the hub typically is underslung uh, due to its more favorable center of gravity by being underslung. Um, but what happens is you eventually get to a point where this teeters enough where you have main contact. Now it's pivoting across this point right here. And if it teeters enough, just like I said before, you can potentially have contact with the mast. And at this point right here, uh, that contact with the mast, you can either have uh, some damage, you can have rotor separation in extreme cases, uh, but mast bumping can occur for, occur for a few reasons. Uh, but we'll cover those in this video. The first reason that you could potentially get into mass bumping is going to be doing during takeoffs and landings on slopes. All right, taking off and landing uh, from slopes. If a helicopter attempts to take off or land to or from a slope, there can be points where the cyclic limits may be reached. So what does that look like? Well, let's say we have our sloping terrain right here. We have our main landing gear making contact. There's the fuselage, the mast, and now we have the rotor system. As the, uh, uh, the pilot applies cyclic in the direction of the slope with little or no collective applied, it's easy to see how this, uh, this can happen. You go from a, uh, a system like that that's very uh, rigidly staying uh, perpendicular 
to the mast and now it's getting to a point where potentially getting into some kind of mast bumping. Now to help prevent this, be sure to have some kind of collective applied prior to displacing the cyclic for a slope takeoff and try to avoid landings in which you have the, uh, the maximum cyclic displacement in any direction. Uh, so typically if this is the freedom of movement of your cyclic in any direction, if you're getting to a point where your cyclic is all the way in one direction and you're trying to land on a slope or you're trying to take off from a slope, you may find yourself getting into some kind of mass bumping. Now, this is probably the, one of the more common uh, conditions. Like I said before, uh, you're getting to cyclic limits. It's really not going to be too severe because um, you can make corrective action for it um, by either uh, choosing a different place to land if you're landing to a slope or applying a little bit more power prior to displacing your cyclic. But like I said, so you're getting to your cyclic limits with uh, little or no collective applied. All right, so the next part uh, of mass bumping is going to be uh, far more severe, and this is going to be your low G flight, typically associated with a pushover maneuver. All right, so low G flight is usually accomplished uh, via a pushover or leveling off uh, or diving following a cyclic climb, and it's going to look something like this. So you have your helicopter flying along this way. The helicopter initiates a cyclic climb, gets to the top, and begins to give forward cyclic or level off. And it's at this point right here where you're going to have a low G condition. Handle this, but semi-rigid systems cannot handle these type of low G conditions. If a semi-rigid attempts this condition, you could have catastrophic damage resulting in the main rotor uh, completely separating. So how does that happen? Well, as the helicopter uh, reaches the crest, uh, you're going to get into a, a type of weightlessness. Uh, as you near the zero G uh, point of your perch, the main rotor thrust at this point is going to be drastically reduced as it unloads. Now the tail rotor still provides that thrust to offset the main rotor, uh, but now there's nothing for it to counteract. So the aircraft begins to side slip and roll towards the right. Now, the pilot sees this and it sees this right roll and tries to correct with a little bit of left cyclic, but this has little or no effect because the main rotor is unloaded. So what does the pilot do? The pilot applies even more left cyclic and the rotor reaches its uh, flapping limit. Now the rotor hub and the mast, uh, depending on the severity and how much dis displacement you have in the cyclic, potentially get in a condition where the hub and the mast make contact. And if the force is sufficient enough, uh, you can either bend or break the mast resulting in the, uh, the rotor um, separating and the fuselage falling to the ground. So in extreme cases, you're having this rotor separation. Now the way to prevent mass bumping for semi-rigid uh, rotor systems is just avoid these pushover conditions altogether. As he says, the Robinson R22 has a semi-rigid rotor system subject to rotor bump if certain conditions are met. The New Zealand Transport Accident Investigation Commission sought answers concerned about mast bumping accidents involving Robinson helicopters in New Zealand. 18 people had died in 14 accidents involving Robinson helicopters, including nine in known low G mast bumping. Did New Zealand conditions of mountainous terrain or weather play a part? They define mass bumping as contact between an inner part of a main rotor blade or a rotor hub and the main rotor drive shaft or mast. These low G flight conditions can be caused by large or abrupt flight control inputs or by turbulence. The risk of mass bumping in turbulence increases with high power settings and operation at high speed and light weight. It is particularly important for Robinson pilots to be aware of the risks of flying a lightly loaded helicopter at high speed in turbulence. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe and hit the notify bell.